Good evening, golf friends, and welcome to our 51st Tuesday Traces. The purpose of our webinar is to show how the V1 pressure mat is used by some of our most exceptional industry partners and why ground force is important for golf students and golf instructors. You can see your swing, but you can't measure it. You can measure ground force, but you can't see it. The combination of those is a pretty powerful piece of data to give your student. Remember, the recording of tonight's web webinar will be available on the V1 Sports YouTube channel in a few days. You'll get a copy of that recording if you've registered tonight after the folks edit, all, out, edit out all of our cuss words. Uh, we love answering questions throughout the evening, so please put them in the chat window. If we happen to miss one, we will follow up later um, with that answer. Okay, a tiny bit about V1 Sports. We, are, we have 26 years of experience as the leader in video plus ground force analysis. Combined with our V1 game on course shot and stat tracking app, our instructors deliver online lessons that improve both your swing and your score. With our recent investment by the one and only Michael Jordan's Black Cat Investments, we have loads of new exciting products and product improvements coming this year. You may have seen some of them in our software. They are going to be released throughout the rest of the year. and We cannot wait to show you all the new things at the PGA show in our beautiful booth that we will have in the same spot as previous years. Okay, I am Mandy Von C, Regional Sales Manager for V1 Sports based in Charleston, South Carolina. Also joining me is my boss, mentor, and very good friendship, Carell. Chip spent 19 years as a PGA professional using the V1 apps before we were lucky enough to have him come join our team and manage me and my boys, the other sales guys on our staff. Um, okay, now let's talk about the reason we're here, Daniel Creel. Daniel is the owner of VC Golf in Florence, Alabama. Daniel, thank you so much for sharing your time tonight and pulling these traces out, and we cannot wait to dive in. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for asking. I'm excited to see what you have to prepare for or what you've prepared for us tonight. Okay, a little bit about Daniel. He is absolutely no stranger to good golf. Remember, I always say your pro should play. Um, Daniel had a successful amateur playing career, first winning his state championship in high school. That got him a scholarship to the University of Alabama, which we will forgive him for because everybody knows that Clemson's a better university than the University of Alabama. But that's okay because he did win – um, the state championship, and he earned two Ping All-American honors during his time there. Daniel teaches all skill level golfers by implementing individual focused programs for each player. He also believes in not only visually capturing his students' actions, but to also be able to quantify a player's movements and habits to more accurately track progress. Uh, Daniel uses a ton of technology, TrackMan, Foresight, FlightScope, and then of course the V1 pressure mat, cameras, V1 Pro soft software, Hack Motion, and K Motion for his instruction. Um, that's a whole bunch of cool technology. And I have a couple questions for Daniel before we dive into the traces. Daniel, first off, um, where were you first introduced to the V1 pressure map? So, actually, ironically enough, it was the Tuesday traces, which that's where I got really familiar with it. Uh, I knew the technology existed. Um, I did a little research online, but I really wanted to get one thing, it's a pretty cool technology, but how easy was it to use is what I was concerned with. And watching Tuesday Traces and seeing some of the guys that spoke, um, I went, followed them on YouTube and just kind of watched them and saw how easy it was. And it seemed like it not only made swing improvements easier for the student, but it made teaching easier for the, the pro. So pressure, the Tuesday Traces. Hey, I, I got to say, I love that. I'm super silly. You guys all know if you've watched before, I'm silly and I cut up. And I always wanted this to be a place where golf instructors could come and learn about this cool technology. So the fact that you did that and learned about it here is a really cool testament. Thank you for that. And also to the folks joining us, please use this as a place to ask questions. If you have any questions about the pressure mat, no matter how silly, if we show you a graph and you don't know what foot is right or left, ask us that. We want to show you all the ins and out of this pressure map because it is really, really easy to use. And if you can learn it from watching me on these silly Tuesday traces, then that's a big testimonial for how easy it is. All right. Um, so I know that you learned to use it by watching traces and following some other partners. Um, can you talk about how you learned it? Yes. Yeah, so it can be a little, any new technology can be a little intimidating. Um, but V1, you guys, your team did a really good job on these traces, introducing 
basically the benchmark. Hey, there, here's, here's some traces to look out for. This is what they mean. This is what, if you see a trace doing this, this could be the tendency in the swing. And it made me comfortable using it right out of the box. Uh, but once you start getting comfortable with it, you can start evaluating your students and, and their swings and the ties to the traces that you're seeing because they're, they're at the end of the day, there's no one trace that's perfect. There never will be. Um, and some of the, the, the instructors I've seen you talk, they say, I've seen, this is not a trace that I, I, I teach, but I've seen a lot of good golfers win on the PGA Tour with this trace. So it can be unique to individuals. And that's what I really enjoy about it. So, um, but yeah, the, the Tuesday trace has really helped me out with getting comfortable with the mat right out of the box. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, you guys, we have some really great ones. If you would like, um, Brandon Stukesbury did a great short game. And then of course, Matt Gowdy um, has a great recording on there as well. Okay. You mentioned to me, Daniel, that the pressure mat has changed how you teach. What do you mean by that? So, you know, I, I got caught up in just, I thought that I had high speed cameras. Um, I had a good launch monitor and it's easy to teach from that, but it wouldn't really quantify what's going on with the footwork. And I really realized quickly that a swing habit or a bad swing habit actually had a tie to what's going on with your ground forces or the pressure on the ground. But, and what could be deceiving is, you know, we, we, we talk about center of mass and we center of pressure and how they differ. Um, all I could see was the center of mass. So I just assumed that the pressure was following the mass when that's not really what was happening. So getting the pressure mat and actually starting, basically, I don't care if it's a, a, a junior that's been playing for 15 years or an adult that's playing for 40 years or somebody that just picked up golf last week, I'm gonna start out with the pressure mat. Um, and then once we get that, that trace to where we want, where they're hitting the ball, you know, somewhat consistent, I always save that trace so we can always go back to it. But it, it's, at the end of the day, one thing that kind of stinks about it is I can take a beginner and get them at the end of the lesson hitting the ball fairly good just by concentrating on footwork. So um, it can, it, it cuts three lessons down to one, really, honestly. But at the end of the day, that means we can progress to more important stuff as far as changing the swing. I, I did a demo last week with a guy in Florida and he said, they just believe it. When they see it, they believe it, right? Like Perhaps I can tell you right. be, to get an 80%, but until I'm seeing it, I'm not believing that. We even see it with the pressure mat and the technology, right? The graphs and the numbers. Um, okay, so you guys, we have, um, we've gotten to know Daniel a little bit and I'm gonna kind of shut up and I'm gonna let Daniel dive into some traces. Daniel teaches a lot of juniors. So he's gonna review three juniors. And if we have time, we'll get to a senior. Um, and I want to, Daniel, I'm going to let you kind of get your screen shared, but while he does that, you guys remember the V1 pressure mat is compatible with V1 Pro in the mobile scenario where there is no cables. Daniel is actually using studio software, so he's got his mat hooked up to a cable. You can see it there coming out the left side of that mat, and then all three graphs will show up in the software. You've got the pressure mapping graph on the top. There's velocity and dynamic vertical force. So um, those are all the three graphs that show up as soon as you plug in the map that are in sync with the video that you take of the golfer's swing. Um, so Daniel, I'm going to let you go for it. Thank you so much for diving in. And uh, yeah, let's, let's hear it. Let's see the first trace. Yeah. So this individual, he's, he's, he's been playing about six months. Um, he transitioned from baseball to golf, uh, just, just wasn't digging the baseball and his dad wanted him to do something and his dad was a big golfer. So uh, Bo came to us uh, relatively new and just off the first thing you can see is the trace. It looks fairly linear and looks good at, at the very beginning. Um, so I'm going to show you a progression from this over two lessons with, with, with Bo and what we kind of did and, and how we're improving his game. Um, but again, like you, like I said, you can see his trace looks fairly good. And for you guys that are not really familiar with this or that are new to the, the, the pressure traces, the white dot is going to be the center of pressure. So that's going to follow basically the pressure in between the left and right foot and where his center of pressure is. Uh, I have mine set up. This is going to be the trail foot I'll mark with a T. This is going to be the lead foot. This is toes. This is heels here. So it's oriented like you're sitting in your chair right now watching the screen, not like the golfer standing. So in this particular golfer, what we noticed is he's getting really deep into his trail, trail foot. I mean, we've got 
what's neat about the pressure mat is it quantifies everything. We're, we're getting upwards of 99% to that trail side. So that becomes an issue, but he actually gets to his lead side very effectively and, and, and early. Um, and this is what I love about the pressure mat, because if you physically look at the center of mass, it looks like he's still standing on his right foot, but he, we can clearly see in our, our trace that he's, he's getting over to his left side. So what I wanted to focus on with this golfer was he's young, he has no physical setbacks, and he, you can see by the red line that I drew on the screen, he is actually swaying to get to his trail side, and he's doing that, and I circled his lead foot because he's coming off his lead foot there. So what I wanted to work on with him is, again, he has no physical setbacks. There's no reason for him to actually have to, to lift that, that lead foot to get, get his rotation. Um, so that's what we worked on there. And what I did is just isolated him here. We worked on the setup, as you can see, a little bit different of a setup. I got him a little bit of shoulder tilt and lean. But I had him do just a short concentrated. And you can see he's still shifting and sliding to his or, or swaying on his on his on his trail leg. But again, we're stopping short at 74%, which is a, a good number. Um, if I had to put a number out there for golfers to, to pay attention to on their takeaway, I like to see my golfers stop between 70 and 85%, uh, preferably 70 to 80%. Um, I would like to see that, that center of pressure stop. So Believe it or not, this individual, we worked on his setup quite a bit, but it took pretty much the entire lesson for him to understand the concept of not really picking up this, this lead foot. Um, but again, what made it nice is I actually sit a monitor. Um, let's see if you can see it here. I'm gonna go ahead and I sit a monitor on the floor so my students can not get out of their, their golf posture and can actually watch their trace um, as they're swinging. So if they would just kind of want to lift their, their head just slightly, they stay in posture and they can, they can actually see the numbers. So that's what I had him do here is he was keeping his eye somewhat on that monitor. And we were just trying to, uh, to stop that weight short of his trail leg. Then we, I'm gonna to jump to lesson number two. And you can notice here, he actually kicked my, uh, my connection. So I didn't get a trace on this one, but I instantly saw that we were still getting to that. We were getting on the outside of that trail foot. So I knew that we were getting too far this way um, on his trail side, but also you can see it's pivoting and, and, and pointing backwards. So he was, and again, I'm assuming on this trace because of center of mass, uh, but he was just holding off back here. So what I did with him, I, I took what he was comfortable with and it's baseball. So I asked him, you know, would you ever throw a ball off your back foot? You know, and he said he wouldn't. And I said, well, show me how you would throw a ball. And then I gave him a reference, you know, what happens to a quarterback if he throws off his back foot, um, he's pretty much going to throw an interception 90% uh, of the time. So I said, I wanted him just to throw a ball and I wanted him to see kind of what this trace, trace would look like and feel him so he could feel himself getting to his lead side in an efficient manner. Um, and more so what I wanted to sh show you here. Is if we go back, you can see how flat footed he is. If I clear these, he's really not allowing his hips to rotate because that foot is so flat footed. And through this drill, I wanted him to show or see himself get off that trail foot. You can see how quickly our center of pressure gets to our lead side as he's about to release that ball, but more so what he's doing with this trail foot and then also how his thoracic rotation is, is extreme and going towards the target. Um, another thing I want to note that's pretty neat about this is you can see how the student is actually winding up here. Um, you'll see that his arm is actually moving a little bit back. He's in his wind up. But if you notice the center of pressure dot actually starts moving to his lead side right now as he's winding up still. And that's what we like to see in the golf swing. We would like to see that basically the center of pressure transitioning to the lead side as the golfer still bringing the club back just shy of transition. And that 
pretty much means that their kinetic sequence is going to be relatively good. They're going to be starting their swing properly with their with their hips and then their their torso and then their arm and then their hands. Um, if it's a little bit late, it doesn't mean their kinetic sequence is out uh, because I've been able to quantify that as well. But again, they're they're going to rely a little bit more on timing. So as we can see here, he releases that ball beautifully and he's at 91 percent on that lead foot. And I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, but this is a lot what I would like the follow through of a golf swing to look like where the chest is pointed at the target. They're off their trail side and you can tell he's pivoted into that, that, that lead heel. So we went to that. Um, and then I got him instantly. He kind of grasped it at that point. And you'll see in this trace as well. And this is again, the same lesson. Um, he still gets deep into his, his trail side. And I'll remind you guys that this is trail or we'll say this is right foot. This is left foot, toes, and heels. So again, the golfer still to this day, we still struggle with him getting a little bit too deep into that, that, that right heel or the trail heel or the trail side. Um, but as long as he's as efficient transferring that weight from his right to his left, I'm actually okay with it. And I'm going to show you something how to – I'm going to concentrate on this velocity map really quick here on this swing. But what you're going to see in this is you're going to see that he has this crescent shape to it. And that's really what, what I believe is called a toe-to-toe -to -toe trace is what I've heard it referred to on these Tuesday traces. And um, why that's significant is what you're able to do with these traces without even focusing on the swing, you can – basically see how the weight is going from basically the lead side to the trail side, then to the trail side to the lead side. You can kind of have an idea of what their swing path is going to look like before you even pay attention to the video. And in this particular student, when he came to me, you can see he was extremely linear. It's almost really good. And I was like, hopefully I don't, I don't want to screw this up, but through the progressions, Look at what I did. I actually caused that trace to go from a linear trace to um, toe to toe trace. And what he was doing, as you can see in this path, how the club is getting outside the hands, he's getting really steep. So I knew instead of, you know, when you, we all as instructors, I would probably say, I'd say 70 to 80% of my students come in here, they're going to early extend and they're going to swing a little bit over the top. Um, so this is something pretty common. And again, I'm not the first instructor that's told them that. They just don't really know how to fix it. So basically, instead of focusing on the swing and saying, hey, we need to get, move your hand path. We need to do this with the club. We need to feel like, hey, to shallow this out. It gets fairly complicated, and it happens in such a, a, a quick you know, space of time on the downswing. It's hard for the student to feel it. But focusing on the feet actually can help it because it's something that we use every day. And I, I seem to have a lot of success by, you know, hey, let's get off the toes, let's get in the heels. And then their swing path is going to be fixed somewhat. Again, they're still going to need some help. Um, so, so Daniel, without pressure, he's made, he started making those swing changes. You're starting to get them out over the top of the swing. And a lot of instructors, first thing they're going to start looking at is, you know, changing the path at the top of their hand start down. Mm -hmm. Using ground pressure, you're just simply able to keep them deeper in the heels longer. And right. And, that worked out. Yeah, and I've heard you guys say it a dozen times on this. Um, the toes are your brakes and the heels are your accelerator. So what's, what's happening here is you can see that his shoulders are getting real bunched up. He's getting jammed. Um, and basically, you can see that he's early extending as well, which is another sign of him losing his spine angle, which again is gonna slow down the rotation, but it all stems from getting out on the toes uh, somewhat. So if we can concentrate on getting the weight to his heels, everything that I just mentioned is gonna improve slightly, if not all of it. Um, again, different students do different things. Uh, so this one, he had a hard time getting into his heels. So what I did is uh, I have this little tool here that I can place uh, an alignment rod into it at an angle that keeps me somewhat shaft parallel uh, to his uh, shaft plane here. As you can see, it's fairly parallel to the noodle. And what that's going to do is 
scare this kid into actually shallowing. But what you can see is the correlation between now we've shallowed out the student's path to get him on his heels because he wasn't able to get there. Sometimes I can get a student to say, hey, we need to stay more in your heels. And it works. But this individual, I just couldn't get get it get it to happen. But you can see he's already leaning a little bit on his heels here, which is really what I wanted him to do naturally on his own without putting the noodle. But the noodles guided him there because he was scared that he was going to hit it. So I'll just go through this, kind of show you a little bit. He sucked it inside. Um, and again, this I believe this was his second attempt at swinging um, on this. But now we can see that the club is now behind the hands and a little bit better. Of a, of a position on the downswing, his hands are in a better position. And you can see here, his shoulder appears to be bunched because he does early extend, but again, we, we're actually maintaining a little bit of uh, shoulder tilt through impact with this. But again, you can see the pressure trace, how we root the correlation between path and footwork, how they work. Um, again, it's, it's different from student to student, how you get them there but visually he could see how, how good his pressure trace was um, on this. And then once he understood that and saw it, this is without any help or anything. This was just power of mind and just him going through the reps and through the process that we did over these two lessons. Um, and you can see he's back to his linear trace. Um, again, we're still getting a little bit too much into that, to that trail hill, but all in all, um, way more success and he's, he's playing much better now. Daniel, and on that trace, right here's something I want to point out that um, once once you use a pressure mat and you used it a little more, you'll realize that this swing did not recalibrate. So if you right. notice, see how it's saying right there. So for the people that are, you know, just watching this for a first time and is, you know, don't really understand or they're getting confused by some of the numbers. If you look at the numbers on the right and the left of the feet, like where it says zero and a hundred, it's saying that there, he's a hundred percent in his heels at this point. Can you sort of circle over where we're talking, Daniel? Yeah. So see how those say zero and a hundred. Well, if he would have stood still for a second before he actually made this swing, that would have recalibrated some at this point, as he's standing, he is not 100% into that heel. But if you look at the line, that's actually moving, you see that that trace is very, you know, it's straight back and straight through. It's not, there's not a bunch of humps and lines in it. So just because it didn't recalibrate, you can still simply look at this and see the shape of the trace and understand the movement that he's made. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you can right click and recalibrate. Um, again, in this trace, I was more concerned about the graph more than the numbers here. And uh, again, but it is a good idea when you're working with your students to, to recalibrate it or just have them stand there a little bit longer before they pull the trigger and it'll recalibrate itself every time. So I completely agree. It's just sometimes when people are just starting out in ground pressure, they start looking at the numbers so much. And if they would have seen that, just looking at the numbers, it looks like they're completely in their heels. But Understood. if you look at the shape of the trace, you actually can see there is some movement into the toes. But, but that's for, Yeah, and I forgot to mention this. In this, I told you I would address this here. Um, you can see where he was out on his toes. And again, looking at the trace, I do like how smooth this trace is going across. That means we were getting somewhere where before it was a little bit jagged. Again, we were going toe to toe. But what I want to focus on is on this lateral, the, 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 the velocity here, the velocity graph is he peaks, which is going to be the correlation and when he's transferring his weight the fastest from his lead to, or his trail side to his lead side. Uh, the way I have this set up is going to be this, this peak to the north here. And the green line, the brighter green line here is actually where he makes contact. So if I fast forward, that's where he's making contact. And you can see he's making, in my opinion, I like to see my students making contact somewhere along this line on the downward slope more towards the bottom because that means that they've, they, there's, they've got a lot of more momentum there as far as uh, they've transferred that weight. They've got a lot more power behind the ball and then they're going to enter the ball. He almost hits it a little too soon um, in my opinion. Again, I don't know, Chip, what you, what you see when you're looking at these graphs, but I noticed him all the way from day one. He was always making contact slightly early. You know, from watching a lot of the, the swings that we have with, you know, some of the best players in the world, a lot of times you're going to see that peak velocity be, you know, 
much, much closer to the top of the, um, you know, the very first few frames of the downswing. Mm -hmm. So they get back and then they start moving and the fastest they're moving into their lead side is, is very early in their downswing. Mm -hmm. And then they, and then again, they're hitting the ball down at the bottom of that peak because they've, at that point, they've moved so far into their lead side that they can't move any further into their lead side. And if anybody has some more questions about that, we can, you know, we can chat about that offline as well. So I'm going to go to a, another student. This one is not as much of a beginner. Um, she's been playing around seven or so years, maybe eight years. And let me get her pulled up. And what's funny is she's been coming to me for two years and I had no idea that she was hanging back on her back foot as much as she was. I knew it was something that we were addressing. Uh, we would watch it from, from lesson to lesson. But again, once I got it quantified and saw it on my mat, I knew it was something that we need to, to address really quick. So I'll show you her. She does a really good job rotating here. She has a little bit of little bit more activity with this knee bending in than, than we like. And again, that's something that we've worked on since. But she actually transitions fairly aggressively. I like she, she I means it's a little late, um, but then all of it stops. And you can see here at the impact zone. And I like to have both of these pulled up because again, you can see here in, in the velocity graph that she starts shifting her weight from her trail to her lead. And then all of a sudden it just bottoms out below the baseline. And that means that she's, that's where this little backwards movement to her her trail side again and let me mark that so you guys Daniel what club what something. club is is she using here mid iron I can't, I can't yeah she's yeah, okay it's probably an probably an eight or a nine iron now she, now just so you that double hump that you see folks that's something that you are going to see a little more often in a driver because there is a bit of a backup to hit up at the ball but it's not something that you typically would want to want to see with that with an iron swing let me ask you, Chip, is that something that you would see due to maybe some elevation in the, the lead foot or something? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, you still from the top of the swing are getting into the lead side, but the mm -hmm. difference is in an iron, you're hitting down on the golf ball to get it to roll up the club face. So you have to stay forward on it. However, to launch a ball up in the air, you know, what we've learned now from launch monitors and everything else, we want to launch the ball up in the air. And so, you know, you need that positive, you know, upward attack so to do that there has to be somewhat of that spine angle moving backwards at some point and so that's yes. why you see that you know they've referred to it you know over the years as a z trace but again it's you're seeing it that you're, you're seeing a second hump in that linear graph yeah and i'll talk to, i got um, graph. yeah the student after this um we'll kind of see a little bit of that and um kind of something I uncovered with him and he, he was a very recent lesson he was a new golfer that came to me last week so yeah I'll jump to that but yeah Maggie here she had a problem that I just didn't know the significance of without the mat and we could see that it was something that we had to address fairly quickly and with her um, I call this the ball drill I'm, I'm sure it's, it's not an uncommon drill uh, so basically what I do with the student is I have them address where they would normally put the ball which is right here and then what I would do is I would move the ball off her front toes. Then I have them make sure they keep the club back where they're comfortable. But then I ask them, hey, what are you going to have to do to hit this ball and actually talk to them about it? Like, hey, I'm trying to prepare you for what you're going to have to do here. And pretty much instantly they're like, how in the heck am I going to do it? Um, and the, the answer is, is you have to get on that, that lead side very, very quickly. And again, we were successful and pretty much it's really neat because instantly – somebody can can do this ball drill i actually like them to, to do it enough to where they're actually getting underneath the ball not topping the ball because i always tell them that if you're if you're not catching the ball clean that means you're not getting to the lead side as quick as you possibly can we need to get there quicker um and you can see she she does a good job she hits the ball and, and we're good and you can see if we go when she makes contact we're 82 percent versus forty one percent on the lead side. So we, we doubled you know the amount of energy that was going to her lead side uh, within minutes. And again, she did quanti sir. 
that ball drill again. Show that one. I, I just want to this. If you look at the velocity graph on this one, if you notice, here's one of the things that I would look at is see where she looks hits peak velocity. So if you pull that back just a bit till she hits peak velocity, so see how she's hit peak velocity early on her way down. Mm -hmm. And then again, as she's moving into impact, look where she is when she's shaft parallel to the ground. Okay, so you see that she's 70% into lead side shaft parallel to the ground and then move her into impact. We would hope to see her not over, you know, around 80. So see, there you go. So we're moving. Those are numbers that I like to look at is where are they hitting peak velocity? Where are they shaft parallel to the ground? We want to see them in between that 70 and 80 into impact. And then you'll see there's that second hump. Now notice this time, the second hump is after impact of the velocity. That's just the weight of her arms pulling her forward. Right. All the energy. So those well, are things, those are ways to look at those other graphs. We can pull up and so I'll show you something with her on the old trace that, that you'll like. Um, and not to get in too in deep depth with it, but again, Chip, we, we talked recently about this on, a, on another call. Is you can see the dynamic vertical forces, which basically the forces that she's applying into the ground. And you'll see that this lead foot stays underneath the trail foot the entire time on her original swing, where when we do the ball drill, you can see them cross just before impact. That's right. Uh, so again, the trace just, this drill did wonders. And I'm telling you, it was in the matter of minutes and she could instantly feel it. Um, again, she has a little bit more toe-to-toe -to -toe trace than we like, but again, I did my noodle drill with her and, and, it, and I'll show you her trace from there. But again, it's just finding the feels for the individual, what works. There's several drills that you can do out there and I have a bunch. So if anybody's interested, they can contact me afterwards. But again, the, there, there's several ways to get there, but we got to make sure the students feel what we're trying to get them to do. Um, so yeah. What we did here with her next is we noticed that the trace, it was too far apart for my liking. Um, so I wanted to bring that back down. And again, I don't necessarily say that you have to have a linear trace, but it, again, I think if somebody's physically capable of getting to a linear trace, which you can see she's moving more from the, the, the center of her foot. And then what I really like about this, when we shallowed her out a little bit, is she really pivots into that heel. And again, you heard me say, earlier that the, the hills are our accelerators. It allows us to continue to rotate through the impact zone and get our thoracic rotation in a positive number and, uh, and to really transfer that energy. So what I had her do, and this is how you get, it, how it differs with each student. So, you know, I had a student on here earlier. I basically started him with his backswing um, doing this drill with her. She was having issues she had a lot on her mind. So what I did is I was like, let's take the back swing out of it and let's just go ahead and get to the top of our swing and let's just teach our brain that we can shallow the club out and rotate to our, our lead heel. And that's what we did with her swinging under the noodle. And I started out without a ball. And uh, you can see that her, her trace is much better, a little bit more linear. And she was still able to get, you know, she's 75% at the impact zone, but again, much, much better. Uh, another thing with this ball drill is good for is you can see where her hands are just above the club here. They're in between her legs there um, because she lost a little bit of momentum through this. This drill also makes you speed up the hands and you can see how at normal impact position, her hands are on her lead thigh. So another good drill for other things, um, not only getting, getting your weight to the lead side, it also speeds the hands up, which is essentially speeding up the thoracic rotation. So, and the last thing with her is she early extends a little bit. And I was able to maintain, and this is something that we're working on a little bit more recent. So we're trying to keep the pressure trace a little bit more linear. She, you can see she likes to get out on her toes still. And again, it's tied to the early extension. So her basically her pelvis is moving towards the ball. She moves a spine angle and the momentum of the club is carrying her out to her toes because her pelvis is moving towards the ball. So we have something here. I think it's been featured on this, hasn't it, Mandy? The uh, 
this drill. So yeah, and and just since we've got we're halfway through, and since we've got a whole bunch of people that have joined us and they missed your original comment, that is from um, our good friend Jake Thurm, the cheek checker drill. And just remind everyone where you learned about two state, where you learned about the pressure mat. Yes. Yeah, so Tuesday actually, I knew about the pressure mat. Yeah, I learned. <laughs> I, I knew about it, and um, yeah, just basically Tuesday traces. So uh, that's where I learned all the information and Tuesday traces. And I believe I watched it, a specific Tuesday trace with Jake Thurm. And, yeah. Uh, so, it. right. And he calls this the cheek checker drill. We can call it whatever you want to. But remember, guys, this is the format and this is the place to ask questions. So any of those graphs that Daniel and Chip are talking about, please give us questions. We're happy to answer them. And we would want you to learn tonight so that you can... Um, maybe be interested in bringing this technology into your academy. So thanks, thanks, Daniel. We love that you, uh, we love that we have great resources for you guys for education. So thanks for tuning in. Yeah, you're welcome. So this is a relatively new student of mine. Um, this we brought, a, couldn't discriminate. I had to get a lefty. Um, and this mat works really good for lefties, but let's keep in mind I do have, this is going to be, let me, this is going to be his left foot, which is going to be his, his, his trail. And this is going to be his right. This is his toes and this is his heels. So the mat uh, actually has the ability, if you right click the top of the mat, you can turn it to a left-handed golfer. So nothing will change but I forgot to do that with this individual, but I, again, I called it really quick and I just kept it the same and I knew how to look at it. But uh, this is gonna be more of a trace, I think, Chip, that you were talking about might partner well with a driver possibly. I don't know if it quite looks exactly like this, but- Well, well you'll see a lot of juniors that, you know, they feel like they have to help the ball up in the air. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're trying to hit up on the ball, this is something you're gonna see. So if, you know, you're working on pitching and you're seeing you know, this, these goofy like backup traces, that, that person's trying to help the ball up in the air. Now on a driver, we want to help the ball up in the air. So you will see that backup. On these, you know, ball on the ground swings where you're trying to hit down through it, you, just, you necessarily don't want to see that as much. Yeah, and there's one thing uh, for you guys that are new to the, the pressure mat or thinking about getting one and, and you get it to look for is basically a, you can get a, you can actually see that they're transitioning to their lead foot. But if that foot comes off the ground like a Justin Thomas, you'll get a quick shift to the trail foot. And that doesn't mean it's a bad trace, but you gotta be careful and make sure that that's the cause of, of that shift in the, the center of pressure. And in this kid, I assumed that that's what was happening, but you'll be able to see in this that it was actually, it's a technique issue. It wasn't that his, his foot was coming off the ground. So I'll go ahead and jump into the swing. So you can see we're shifting to the trail foot as, as we should, which is gonna be his left side. And you can see there's a lot of instability and we're working on that through um, a few exercises in his lower body. But he starts shifting forward, everything's good. And then all of a sudden this starts coming, um, back and you can see that his foot is clearly still planted but when I was watching him full speed we're about to see that that foot elevates and I thought that that was the cause and I was like maybe this is an acceptable trace but when you deep dive into it, it it's just not um, we have a technique issue and you'll see that this foot comes up at impact but he ever so slightly has pressure into these toes here and you can see that reflected into into the, uh, the pressure uh, trace, and you'll see that he makes contact at 53%. Um, so this kid was a baseball player. Um, his dad actually played at UT and um, University of Tennessee. So I was kind of surprised that he was shifting him over to golf, but he, 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 again, that's, that's the cause. So I figured, hey, let's do a step drill with him. Um, let's see if this will help him get to his lead side. So for you guys that are not familiar with the step drill, and again, I choose my drills. I just don't reach into my hat and just grab out drills, just hoping something will work. I try to do something that they're familiar with. And again, stepping into a, a pitch or stepping into throw is something that this kid was, was very familiar with um, and thought that I was gonna be successful with it. So what I do is I have the golfer actually address the ball normally. Um, 
And then all I have them do is bring their lead foot and touch their trail foot. And uh, at that point, I have them bring the golf club back to the center of their feet. And then I want them to actually start stepping as they're bringing the club back. So I want them to start bringing the club back and basically at club parallel to arm parallel, I want them to start stepping forward into the shot. And he does a, a good job of it. You can see he starts stepping a little bit late, but you're gonna see he steps into it beautifully, but he still wants to hang back. And I was really puzzled by this because I expected him to get onto that, that lead side and stay there. And um, his, his dad was, was, was watching the lesson and said that this has been a fight of his in baseball. He, he hangs back and he, he hits a lot of pop flies and just, just misses the, the pitches. So knowing that this is a trade, I knew that a step drill wasn't going to work for him because he's going to fall right back into what his brain knew, which is falling back to that trail side. So what I wanted to do is, if you can see my cheek checker here, you notice I have this little foam piece that actually sticks out. I can rotate it under when it's not in use, but I could rotate it forward. Um, and you can use this for people that have issues with swaying or if you're trying to promote swaying. In this case, I am because he has a very active lower body and we can see that I'll go back to his original. Here, and that's my little imaginary wall. And I want this kid, we should be hitting into that wall. And if not just touching it, we need to be breaking through it. You can see he goes up to it, kisses it, and then he pulls back and we have, we have space there and we have that tilt. I want you to pay attention to the velocity map here. You can see his dynamic vertical force, pretty aggressive there as the total number, but you can see that he, he plummets um, right here, that, that spike is a pretty aggressively going down. Uh, and here I'm actually wanting to promote him to slide into it. So we could see that he had good rotation. So I knew there was no rotation issues, but we needed a little bit more lateral movement. Um, so what I wanted him to do is actually feel himself punch into this noodle with his lower body. So let's see how well he does here. You can see he nudges it right there. So we actually have him breaking through our imaginary wall, and you can see both on the velocity graph and the dynamic graph, impact is made at a perfect location, and we have 92% of his energy uh, is on his lead side as he's making contact. So even though he was familiar with baseball and stepping into it, he still had faults in that other sport, so we had to take him to something a little bit more like this and get some feedback elsewhere. So let's see, um, and this is with no training aid. Um, and again, this was this kid's first lesson. I believe he had been playing, I think he'd been around golf maybe a year and a half, but actually taking it serious maybe the last few months. And this was his first lesson ever. Uh, but you can see we have a much cleaner trace and I'll just compare it. You can see the one on the right of my screen or your screen, you can see we have a clear figure eight there to where now we have some sort of motion that's got some consistency to it and it goes to the lead side like it's supposed to. We do have an issue, and again, it's a, a stability issue. He has a little bit of disassociation uh, work that we got to do with his lower body and his upper body, uh, but he has a little bit of stability and that's what's causing this hesitation up top. But again, he's able to beautifully get to his lead side by the end of the lesson. And you can see now, he's actually touching our imaginary wall where before, let's get over here and redraw this line. You can see he's not approaching that at all. So just focusing on feet in a drill or two, he was able to get there. Um, so really, really successful lesson. And I will say this about this kid, I'm bragging about him a ton. We have a local uh, city league that the city does. And um, yeah, basically everybody's like, how did you get so good at golf? Because they knew he played baseball. And uh, he came up to me. I was uh, helping coach one of the little teams yesterday. And uh, he said he's hitting a seven iron 15 yards longer by doing these drills. So really, really big success. He's hitting the ball really good. 
So again, he's a, he, he was willing to put in the work as well. That's awesome. Sounds like not only Parker speaking highly of you, but uh, Paul McCrory, who's on this te- on this chat, said one of the best instructors out there. So <laughs> you must uh, you must agree, with Parker. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, yeah. So my last one, I'm actually going to jump to just an older gentleman. This just gentleman struggles with weight control. Again, he's very limited in his swing. Um, he has a lot of physical setbacks just going on, and it's none that he can control over, but again, it's just age ca- catching up to us. So let me get him pulled up. And again, stop me if I'm running over. I'll uh, I'll be brief with him. Yeah, I mean, we, we got we got about five minutes or so, so we can leave some time for uh, wrap up questions. So this this trace I actually see. I don't have a name for it. It's just a random scatter trace. Uh, <laughs> but you can see he doesn't get to his left side, and I find that very common with. Anybody that has, you know, a tighter body or they're a little older, they're trying to guard their back or a hip or something like that. They just, they just don't really move anywhere with their weight. Um, what I will do here is let me remind you folks, this is going to be right foot this time. This is left foot, toes, heels. And you can see everything starts out well. He transitions decent. Um, it's a little late, but again, we got that energy going back to that right side and just look at how this ball, how vertical it starts out. I mean, <laughs> it, it, the ball is going straight up. I mean, it's about to hit my ceiling in my bay. So again, part of that is you're not, instead of just saying, Hey, we need to get your you know, lead with the hands a little bit more. I mean, that's a complicated thing to do and to time it correctly. All we got to do is just fix the pressure. So I worked with him for quite a while for him to, to do it, but just physically it was hard for him to comprehend and do. But I did find uncover during the lesson that he plays tennis. And I was like, well, perfect. The tennis stroke is very much like the golf. I mean, you, as far as the weight distribution and how we want to get to our lead side. So I said, if you, if you hit a tennis rat ball off your, your back foot, the, the ball would go over the net. I mean, you would spend a fortune in tennis balls. I said, what I want you to do is just turn the, I had him flip the club upside down, stand on the mat. And I said, don't think about anything to show me how you would hit a tennis ball. So he does that and you can see how perfect that trace is and just how consistent it is and how straight that line is. And by the time he would make contact with the tennis ball would probably be about right here. And he has 96% of his weight on his, on his lead side. So he was just having Yes. Why, why is it easier to swing a tennis racket and a baseball bat? Why do we freak out when the ball is stationary? But, so I, I don't mean, know, <laughs> but I tell people, I'm like, it's just like putting, you know, a 16 year old in front of a girl, a boy in front of a girl. They just do crazy things. Um, <laughs> we, we can't explain it. it it's, it's just, <laughs> I love that. It's speaking to the but, mom of a 14 and 16 year old boys. I can testament to that. <laughs> Well, he, he, this, so Alan was getting very frustrated with this because it's such a simple concept, but yet he couldn't just do it. And taking something that he was familiar with, he did it. And all of a sudden now he realized he was re-energized during the lesson because he's like, I can do this. I mean, it's just as simple. And you can see, we've got a lot of rotation. His chest is pointed towards where he's trying to hit the ball. His pelvis is around. And again, he's off his back foot, allowing for, all of this rotation that all of us professionals want our players to get this, this rotation through here and to open up to the target and get that chest high into the target. So again, without even thinking about it, now he was re-energizing. He was sold on the fact like, Hey, Daniel, I'm committed. I know I can do it. I just got to figure out how to do it. Like you said, Mandy, with a ball stationary in front of me. Um, So again, a really, really good turning point in this lesson. And that's why I wanted to share it. Um, I'll show you a different view of him. So we got him, the concept down and then we went early extension was a big player in him he was losing his spine angle again going back to our what you guys call the cheek checker and you can see the difference in this pressure trace not only are we pivoting into the heel but we're also keeping this pressure trace we're going heel to heel almost nearly with with him and he made contact um 
and he, he never in a million years did he think that he would get there. Again, he's a little slower getting to his lead side than we would like. It's work in progress, but again, we have him in a, in a good direction. And you can see trace one versus where he is now. So very, very good progress with him. So this, this pressure mat is excellent for all skill levels. And uh, people love it. They absolutely love it. When I run into people uh, in town, that's what they talk about most of the time is the pressure mat. And, uh, I didn't say this earlier, but if I had to choose one or the other, and I'm not saying it because I was invited to do, to do this trace, but um, I think launch monitors and pressure mats and high speed cameras and all of that is, is necessary um, for, for what we do as for a living. But I, honestly, this pressure mat is invaluable and I would probably choose it first over a launch monitor if I was choosing to invest. Um, one, it's not as expensive as some launch monitors, and plus, it, it, it tells you everything that the golfer is doing and why the golf ball is doing exactly what it is, maybe a pattern, and whether it loses an efficiency. It may not be quantifying the, the path and the face, but you can get a good idea through cameras what's going on there. So, again, pressure mat has been a talk of our town. You mentioned that, Daniel, and I think, I think it's awesome that you say it that way because for years – you know, we fit golf clubs as a golf professional. You fit golf clubs with your eyes. You could see that you could see the ball rising in the air. You knew spin rate was too high. You could see launch angles. You know, back in the day, you wanted that low launch with the rise. Once we learned a little bit more, you wanted to launch high. Um, those are things you could always see with your eyes. Until the first time I saw a pressure mat and understood, you know, a little bit about it, completely changed a lot of these things that you're mentioning right now. You know, keeping the weight deeper in the heels fighting early extension, you know, getting weight into lead side earlier. Um, I can't agree with you more. I love the fact that you made the comment, not me. Yeah. And <laughs> appreciate that. I'll, I'll tell you. So the launch monitor is awesome. Again, I think all that data is more important to the instructor than the student because they can get lost in that data. But when you're focusing, say you got a new student coming in, what I've realized to get them one, they got to get comfortable with you. And then you, Basically, you're telling them something that they've already heard before. You're not going to be their first instructor that they've been going to. Um, and they've struggled with the swing path. Say, We'll say in his instance, he's swinging over the top. Uh, well, he keeps going back to the over-the-top swing after the Band-Aid that you know an instructor gave him because his footwork was never improved. So now that you can address the real foundation issue uh, of that swing path, the, the fix of the path is going to stick longer, if not indefinitely. If that makes sense. I love to, um, I learned something tonight from you, Daniel, and I learned that you took two of your students and you related something in their past, tennis and baseball, that they're familiar with, and you had them just do that motion on the pressure mat to get them moving properly. So, you know, dive into what people are familiar with in other athletic motion sports where the ball's moving. It seems to be easier to get there, but, you know, you definitely said you had two breakthroughs with two of these students that we saw tonight, when you pulled their baseball or their tennis activity in. So I think that's really, really important. Also want to point out, um, Daniel, you're driving our B1 studio software beautifully. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, we always get a kick out of golf pros using our tools. However, when they use our tools and it's just so seamless and, and neat, it's, it's really special. So thanks for showing off our software as well as our pressure mat. Um, it's nice to watch you drive for sure. And, and you do it well. Well, it, and just as a note, you know, the, you know, Daniel is working in our studio software. You know, if you're a mobile only person, um, we watched Matt Gowdy, our last Tuesday trace, he was working off mobile. So if you're a mobile person and you want to see, you know, movement and see how, um, how well Matt used um, our mobile solution, you know, you can watch that one as well. He was able to do the exact same thing on the mobile solution. And if you need any additional training or if there's anything that you saw him do tonight that you're not comfortable with, let us know. We do have an entire inside customer success team with Marcella and Jackson. They'd love to sit down, mm -hmm. chat with you and make sure, you know, if there's any questions you have, you know, I'd love to be able to get them involved with you. Also, anyone that wants a pressure mat demo, we've made a couple of notes for Darian and Kevin that reached out. We'll do one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, pressure mat zooms where we can have Chip dive into those other graphs um, and give you some one-on-one -on -one 
training on those. So we will set that up. We're going to reach out to you. We made a note um, of those folks that had some questions I, and we'll do, we'll do some one-on-one. -on -one. And I use this mat indoors primarily, but again, like you guys said, we have a short game facility. I'll just unhook it within, within 45 seconds. I can have it hooked up to an iPad and throw it in the bunker or on the green chipping or whatever. And it works really good. So we have a question from, or it's more of a comment from Frank Villar. He says, I'm not an instructor or a pro, but just a regular golfer. I've had my pressure mat for about two months and now that I'm using it, it's phenomenal. And I agree, it's a game changer. Since I've been working with it, I can really see my weight shift is not ideal for, is not ideal for weight shift to lead foot start prior to finishing my backswing. So, okay, so Frank, are you asking, should your weight be shifting into your lead side prior to your backswing? So Frank, we'll follow up with some questions. Um, I'll follow up with a call for, with you so we can be on the same page, um, just to make sure that I'm reading the question properly. But yeah, um, you want your weight to begin, you want that velocity to move into your lead side, um, but you want it to happen, you know, during the beginning to middle of your downswing, but prior to shaft parallel to the ground, if I'm asking, seeing the question properly. But again, I'll follow up and, you know, either with a phone call or a webinar, we can, we can chat about that as well. All right, I'm gonna wrap up our traces. Um, thanks for the question, Frank, we'll get back to you. And I just wanted to thank Daniel for your time and for preparing the traces and all of your drills. Um, Michael Blaze will edit our recording and he will probably take some snaps of key moments where Daniel shared those great drills. We'll post those as well. If you have questions, our contact information is over there in um, the chat. And please keep an eye out for our next Tuesday trace, or if you're interested in hosting one, please let us know. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great week and enjoy the golf and let us know if there's any questions. Have a good night, everyone.